Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Gains in Glaucoma Research Community Forum. My name's Bronwyn Sugden. I'm the Gifts in Wills and the Supporter Services Lead here at Sierra. Um, I'd like to begin this morning by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we work on, the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the Elders, both past and present. I'd also like to just run through some quick housekeeping with for you. The toilets, if you need them, please enter through the door on my left and turn right and follow the wall to the end. You can also go out and turn to the left and you'll see the signage there. In the unlikely event of an emergency, we ask that you follow all directions from the wardens and calmly exit the building. For those of you who are vision loss, I'd like to orientate you this morning. I'm standing behind a very large lectern in a green dress and there's an even larger screen behind me where the audience will be shown slides. Any unusual noises that you hear this morning will be the butterflies in my stomach because this is the first time I've stood in front of a live audience and spoke. So I'd like to, I'm delighted to be here with you and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone in the audience and to everyone joining us online this morning. Each year in March we recognise World Glaucoma Week and this year's theme is Uniting for a Glaucoma Free World and Bringing Communities Together to Fight Against Glaucoma Blindness. While we're here today in Melbourne, in Japan they have light up green, which is where they project green lights onto their buildings. In India there's a Glaucopedia conference. There's also a live broadcast this week on Good Morning Kazakhstan. And in Malaysia there is a free glaucoma eye checkup for their firefighters. So you're all in very good company around the world. For those of you that receive our digital monthly newsletter iNews or our twice yearly newsletter Visionary, you may already know that glaucoma affects the optic nerve connecting the eye and the brain. Around 300,000 Australians have glaucoma, but about half of these people aren't diagnosed and don't even know because the symptoms are so minimal. This means that many people with the disease don't notice anything is wrong until vision loss is advanced. Our sight is perhaps one of our most precious senses and through our research at CIRA, we're committed to developing new treatments which will make life better for people with ageing eye disease, such as glaucoma, and help to put hope in sight to restore their vision. Today we'll be hearing from four researchers who will each speak for approximately 15 minutes. We'll then have plenty of time for uh, ask questions and answers from both the online community and people in the forum today. Now I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Luis Alacon Martinez, who some of you may recognise from the f most recent edition of Visionary. Luis is a principal investigator at CIRA and head of visual neurovascular research. His research focuses on how vascular dysfunction may contribute to neurogenerative disorders and vision loss. Luis has spent over a decade working in visual science and neuroscience in Europe, Canada and the United States. He has developed sophisticated technical skills including innovative imaging setups and microsurgical skills to study retinal diseases such as glaucoma, age-related macular disease and ischemic retinopathy. Please welcome Dr. Luis Alacon Martinez. Thank you so much, Ron. It's really a pleasure for me being here, and thank you so much for coming. It's really an honor to be here and, and give you an update about what we are doing here in Syria, and particularly in our, in our unit. Um, well, I'm Luis Alaco Martinez. I'm the head of the Neurovascular Research Unit here in Syria, and I'm going to show you what we are doing here in our unit. Hope you like it. So, in science, we have different types of research. This is important that, that you understand. Um, we have three different types. We have what we call basic research, where we are trying to understand the fundamental questions in, in vision. Uh, for example, how we are seeing, how the retina can get energy, etc. These are the, the basic mechanisms that after translational research um, uses for create, to create new treatments that potentially can be applied to, to people. 
Um, and finally, we have the clinical research where we can um, be sure that these new treatments, these potential new treatments are okay for to use in, in, in the population, in the people. Particularly in our unit, what we are doing is the, the first type of research. This one, basic research. And we are trying to understand how is the communication between nerve cells, neurons, and the blood vessels. Let me get into that. Well, as you know, we are working in the visual system, in the eye. Um, we like to compare the eye always with a camera. We, our eyes like catching all the uh, scene, all the images outside. And as a camera, our eye has a film or a CCD where we can project all the images outside. Um, this, this film in our eye is what we call the retina. It's this thin layer in the back of the eye. And it's where we are, our eyes is projecting all that, as you can see here in the video. This retina has what we call nerve cells or neurons, that you're very familiar with them. And these are extremely important. In the retina, we have neurons, not only in the brain. In the retina, we have also. And these are very important because these, are, these neurons are the ones that take the light and transform this light into electrical signals that are going to be sent to the brain, as Brown was saying before, that uh, the brain is important, uh, right? Because it's receiving all this information from the eye. Um, these are the nerves, uh, the nerve cells, the neurons. But as you can imagine, these neurons need a lot of energy. They are working all the time. And interestingly, we don't know why, these nerve cells, these neurons, they cannot store energy. They cannot keep, you know, like taking the food for after. I'm not, I'm not working now. I'm going to take it later. They cannot do that. So they need all the time to ask for energy when they are working. And you can, you may wonder from where is coming that energy. And then that's why we are having um, our vascular system. As you can see here on the left, we have our vascular system, our blood. In the blood, we have oxygen and nutrients, food for the neurons that are going to be delivered to these nerve cells, to these neurons. Um, on the right, we have, this is the retina of, of a person. You can see that there are a lot of vessels, a lot of blood vessels in the retina. We have a lot of blood vessels. And into the blood vessel, all the, the blood is, is running, and we have there these nutrients that are going to get into the neurons. That's fantastic. We know it happened, but we don't know how it happened. And again, I'm returning. We are, our unit is, is using the, bi, the type of research is basic science, and we are trying to understand how these neurons are talking to these vessels to get this energy. We have no idea. And now here in Syria, we have a very cool technology that we can see into, the, into these vessels at the same time that we are seeing how these nerve cells are working. So again, just to clarify that, in our unit, what we are trying to do is to understand the communication between nerves, neurons, and blood vessels to see how they can obtain these oxygen and nutrients from the blood. That is what we are doing, what my team is doing, that they are here, and what we are spending our time. But why this is important for glaucoma? We are in the, in the week of glaucoma. This is important. Well, glaucoma, as you know very well, is a very important disease. We are, trying, we are working hard just trying to, to help people suffering from this disease. Um, as you see, it's very prevalent in Australia. 4% um, of people over 40 is suffering from glaucoma. So it's really important. Probably you know that the glaucoma, the, the, we say always the main risk factor. It means that we know that something that is very important in glaucoma is that the high intraocular pressure, the pressure into the eye, that is very high. But unfortunately, the treatments we are having is only to reduce this intraocular pressure. But unfortunately, we have older patients suffering from glaucoma that they don't have intraocular pressure. Or when we are using different treatments to reduce this, this intraocular pressure, this force into the eye, it doesn't work. It's still, um, the disease is ongoing. So it means that there are other things that we are missing, very important things that we are missing besides the high intraocular pressure into the eye. So this is why we are studying this neurovascular, this neuron 
blood vessel communication because we are thinking that it can be very important for glaucoma, for people suffering from glaucoma. Why we are thinking that? Because we are seeing that people suffering from glaucoma, they present vascular abnormalities. They present, for example, smaller vessels. They present like the flow of the blood is not as much fast, maybe because high, uh, because high pressure into, the, into their vessels, etc. And so we are seeing that people suffering from glaucoma, they are having vascular issues too. So it's like, why we are not going to look at it um, when we know that can be important. Let me get into a little bit more, a, a next step into our research. Um, recently, what we found, we started to study one very, very new element into the vessels. That is what is called pericytes. These are a new type of cell a uh, uh, um, that we recently started to study. Here they are represented in red. The vessel, the blood vessel is in green. And what we have is these pericytes. And they are located around these capillaries, around these vessels, blood vessels. And we know that they are like muscles. They can, they can um, squeeze the, the, the vessels. So you can imagine if these pericytes, if these new elements that I'm telling you, they start to squeeze too much, the blood that is passing through is going to go slower. So we started to see, oh, maybe this can be a good target to, to keep an eye on it for, for glaucoma. And we saw something very cool recently too, is that these pericytes, these red cells that you are seeing here, this one, that, as I told you, can squeeze the vessel, as you can see here in the, on the right. They started, we saw that also they are presenting these lateral, very, very, very tiny tubes. They are tubes connecting pericytes from different vessels, cells from different vessels, that can control how much they are squeezing the vessels. And the cool thing here for us is that we started to see that these pericytes and these tubes that are connecting and controlling this squeezing, they are broken in models of glaucoma. It means that potentially people suffering from glaucoma, they can have less number of these small tubes and it can increase the constriction of these vessels. Um, so we are very excited about that because it can be a new you know, target that we can use to, to treat people um, suffering from, from this disease. These are different examples. So what we found is that, again, these, these, two, these pericytes that I was telling you and these two small tubes are controlling actually the blood flow, what we say, the flow of the blood into the vessels. And this is just showing, let me point it out. This is just showing that, yeah, this is just showing, the, as you can see here, these shadows is just showing the, the different cells that are traveling into the vessels. You can see that one of the vessels presents a lot of cells, a lot of things traveling into the, in the blood, and the other one is less. So this is one of the ways that we can quantify how many cells are passing in one vessel, other cells that are passing. It means nutrients and oxygen arriving to the neurons before. So for us, it's, it's, it's good because it's a way to measure. But... As we were saying before, vision is not only in the eye, it's also in the brain. All the things that we are getting into, into the eye, is projected into the, into the brain through the optic nerve, as you can see here. So we are also in our unit, we are very interested to, to see what is happening beyond the eye. We wanted to see if not only in the retina, not only in the eye, we wanted to see too what is happening at the level of the, of the brain. That is at the end where we are seeing, right? In the brain. So our unit is also working on that. This is, a, and this is another example that we are seeing here. What I wanted to show you very quick is that the technology that Sira has now here, and we are very grateful for that, um, is that we can see single vessels, single neurons. These are neurons, the green ones are these nerve cells that we we're talking before. We can see these single cells and these single vessels, these small tubes, we can see that how they are working um, in real time. So then we can study what is happening in, in glaucoma with these structures, with this communication. 
Just to mention that we are very proud that we are part of an international team that Syria is leading. So we have people um, not only in Syria, we have, well, in Syria we have the best ones. We have to be very proud of the people working here and all the students and re research associates, etc. But we have also very important collaborations with Canada, with other countries, uh, top, top in the world. And we are very lucky, particularly our, our unit is very lucky because we are having uh, good funding. So we want to thank, of course, um, for all the support, all of you, of course, too. Um, and just to finish, just to say that our unit, our aim is trying to add new treatments to the current ones, basically trying to improve the, the, the vascular side of the, of the people suffering from this disease that we think that, that can, be, can be good to, to add to the current treatments. That is the decrease of the intracular pressure. And now I can take questions. And thank you so much again for being here. That's amazing. Thank you, Luis. That's really extraordinary. So I'm sure there'll be questions during the Q&A. I'd now like to introduce you to Associate Professor Zi Chao Wu, another Principal Investigator and Head of Clinical Biomarkers Research here at CIRA and an Honorary Principal Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Zi Chao is a clinician scientist whose research aims to maximise te technological advances to prevent irreversible vision loss, especially with common eye conditions such as age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma. Zichao's work focuses on establishing new biomarkers of these conditions using state-of-the-art imaging and functional assessment of the eye, which are used in clinical trials for the discovery of new treatments. These biomarkers are also developed to enable the earlier detection of these conditions and their progression, prediction of vision loss, and the uncovering new insights about what causes these conditions. His research is undertaken in collaboration with researchers and industry, both nationally and internationally. Now I'd like to hand you over to Zee Chow. Thanks very much, Bron, and thank you all for coming today. It's so wonderful to see you all here this morning. Um, and as Bron said, my name is Zee, and this morning I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're currently meeting on. Um, so this morning, I'd like to try and give you some insights into what we're currently doing to try and facilitate the discovery of new treatments for glaucoma, for slowing its progression, and even preventing its development. And I want to specifically do this by helping you see the critical role of clinical biomarkers research, which is what I do, in expediting treatment discovery. But first, let's take a little quick overview of the key issues we face in glaucoma. As Lewis touched on, um, we know that 1 in 50 Australians will develop glaucoma in their lifetime. But thankfully, we live in an era in this 21st century that we have a range of treatments available for slowing its progression, all the way from eye drops to lasers to surgical interventions. But despite treatments, some people, a proportion of people, can still progress and lose vision from glaucoma, again, as Lewis mentioned and alluded to. I'm going to try and get your blood supply moving a little bit, and I'd love to get a show of hands to try and see, within 20 years of being diagnosed with glaucoma, how many people do you think would become blind in at least one eye? Who, uh, I like a show of hands for those who think it's at least one in 20 people who will go on to develop blindness in at least one eye despite treatment. Who's got hands over here? Okay. Oh, okay. Just a few. All right. Keep those hands up. Keep those hands up. Now, amongst all of you who have your hands up, who amongst you think it's at least one in 10? Okay. Hands still there. Oh, a few dropped. What a one in five? I'm not an auctioneer, I promise. Okay, so <laughs> still a few here. Now, shockingly, it's actually one in three people who um, within 20 years of being diagnosed with glaucoma will actually become blind in one eye based on the definition provided by the World Health Organization. And within this 20 years, one in seven people 
will become blind in both eyes. Well, this occurs despite the range of treatments that we have in glaucoma. So we have to ask ourselves, why are people still going blind from glaucoma? And again, as Lewis mentioned, one of the, much of the treatments for glaucoma currently focus on reducing that intraocular pressure or eye pressure, because this is um, in recognition that it is one of the most important modifiable risk factors for this disease. But one of the things that we've seen is that between a quarter to half of the people with glaucoma that present with glaucoma actually have eye pressures within the quote-unquote normal range. And conversely, only about 10% of people with, very high eye, with, with high eye pressures go on to develop glaucoma. So if eye pressure is the only thing involved in glaucoma, then almost everyone with glaucoma should present with high eye pressures and everyone with high eye pressures should develop gl glaucoma. But that's clearly not what we see. And the last fact is that a previous randomized trial of two different eye drops for glaucoma showed that um, the two of them can reduce the eye pressures to a similar extent, but the two treatments had a significant difference in their ability to preserve and slow down vision loss. So once again, this all points towards how eye pressure is only but one important part of the full picture of the issue in glaucoma, and that there's a big unmet need to help us find new treatments that can complement this, um, this current treatment strategy to prevent irreversible vision loss. Now, despite the recognition that we do need new therapies, there's this currently widely held belief that glaucoma trials are just too hard to perform because there's a thought that there's a need for thousands of people to be involved in each trial of, of, a, of a promising therapy. And this has in part been attributed to the so-called failure of this trial of an oral tablet called Memantine, which started back in 2005 and included more than 2,000 people that were seen for up to a four-year period. Now, memantine is a drug that's thought to help protect the nerve um, tissue in the eye that's damaged in glaucoma. And so this trial tried to see if it could help complement the current eye pressure lowering therapies. And unfortunately, the trial did not show a significant beneficial treatment effect. And the results of the trial were actually only published 12 years after it first started. And this actually left an impression and actually a bit of nervousness in the field that new therapies or trials of new therapies to complement eye pressure lowering um, treatments will be too hard, too hard to do, too expensive, and it will take far too long. And so why is it that we need thousands of people over many years to evaluate a new treatment like this old oral memantine trial? Um, I believe there are two main reasons that are contributing to this. And first, the visual field test, or the field of vision test. Now, um, this is a test where you have to press a buzzer to um, see when you see a dim spot of light throughout your visual field. And again, can I get a show of hands of who's ever done one of these tests in their lives? Great, keep them up. Now, who amongst you have thoroughly enjoyed that test? Keep your hands up. <laughs> Oh, there's always one. <laughs> you know, there's, there'll always be one. Some people do enjoy it, fair enough. As you can see, the majority do not. Because this test is not easy. When you're trying to measure um, how well someone can perceive light, this test involves measuring the minimum light level that's perceptible. And so you will be presented with spots of light that are just barely perceptible. And so it's difficult, and it's a, a task that inv involves difficult judgment calls. And actually, for some people, it can be quite anxiety-inducing because it's a test that's used for, for guiding the management of, of glaucoma. And in fact, this is the main test that's used to, to assess the effectiveness of new treatments in glaucoma. And because it's so subjective and challenging to perform, 
the results are often highly variable. And that's why we do need thousands of people over many years when using such a test to see if a new treatment works. Now, the second issue is that we currently have a really difficult time trying to identify for whom the current eye pressure lowering treatments are not effective for or inadequate. And we have a really difficult time trying to identify those people at high risk of losing vision despite these current treatments. Because these people that are at a high risk are actually already being managed more aggressively or more intensely. So with these two challenges, does that mean the groundbreaking work that's done by my talented colleagues here at CIRA and elsewhere globally, does this mean that this research is going to fall into this sort of so-called translational valley of death just because it is too hard for us to find, to prove or to show in a new clinical trial that a treatment works. Well, I think we could all pack our bags and say that's unfortunately the case unless, unless we find a way to overcome these barriers that we face with evaluating new treatments in glaucoma. And that's actually the main focus of my research. And I hope to try and show you some of the things that we're doing to try and overcome these challenges. So first, advances in imaging means that we are now able here at CIRA um, with the state-of-the-art equipment that we have to, to visualize with a much more expansive field of view of the tissue that's typically invisible um, that's damaged in glaucoma. So we have that imaging to help us see the damage that's occurring with much greater precision and confidence. And this allows us um, to see even up to individual bundles of the nerve tissue that, you know, Lewis shown in, in a dish, but in the human eye, where you can see these individual bundles of the nerve cables or tissues inside the eyes. And so being able to see and quantify this progressive loss of the nerve tissue in an objective way could give us far greater precision with capturing the progression of this, is, of this disease, much better perhaps than subjective visual field testing. But we know that glaucoma, one of the challenges with glaucoma is that um, this change in that tissue over time not, doesn't just occur in those with glaucoma, it actually occurs with healthy aging as well. And unfortunately, the variation in normal age-related changes actually overlaps quite a bit with what we see in glaucoma. But the thing that we don't see in people with, in healthy aging is that um, this pattern, these distinctive spatial patterns of real glaucomatous damage that deepens and expands over time. And these distinctive changes are what will help us be more specific and more precise at identifying glaucoma progression. And in fact, that's what we're doing now to train artificial intelligence models to try and detect and quantify these specific patterns of glaucomatous damage. Now, even if we can image these patterns of damage, we need to show that these cellular changes do also correspond clinically to meaningful changes in visual function. Just because you lose a cell clinically doesn't mean your vision is going to be affected or at least in a measurable way. So how do we understand how much nerve tissue needs to be lost before um, we see a change in vision? Because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And to help us with that, we're kind of doing the hard work of people like some of yourselves who might be involved in our research studies over here to use this technique called microperimetry to assess a very focal and localized regions of the back of the eye function so that we can understand that spatial relationship between cell loss and vision loss. Now, another group at CIRA led by Professor Peter Van Weingarten and Dr. Xavier Hadou um, has also been developing an, another promising imaging technique of the eye called hyperspectral imaging. This technique has been used in other fields like agriculture and geology and even astronomy. 
and it, it involves capturing how uh, the tissue at the back of the eye reflects light to different um, specific um, narrow wave bands of light. And this is useful because we know that materials of different compositions can actually reflect light quite distinctively, differently. And so this is very useful in glaucoma because previous studies um, in, the, in these animal studies have shown that the nerve cells that become damaged in glaucoma actually trigger the survival mechanism that results in a change in the appearance of these cells before they irreversibly become lost. So there's this period where they're sick and they're struggling and they're trying to survive that the nerve cells change in their appearance. And if we can go ahead and use, an, use a way of imaging the eye to detect the changes in the, in the appearance of these cells, this could potentially give us a way of identifying cells in the eye that are sick but not yet dead and potentially rescuable with new treatments. And this also could be an incredibly useful way for identifying those at high risk of progressing as well. And so hopefully this gives you a little glimpse of all the things that we're investigating in clinical studies, some of the things, sorry, that we're investigating in clinical studies here at CIRA. And our group in particular has seen over 300 people um, in these clinical studies over the last two years towards this overarching goal of trying to help us facilitate new treatment discovery in glaucoma. And again, to those of you, some of you in this room who might have participated in some of these studies or who has provided support for some of these studies to happen, I want to sincerely say a thank you to you because this is the only way that we can help us continue to progress to find a new treatment for glaucoma and prevent irreversible loss from this condition. Thank you very much. I think back to when I was probably 19 and hadn't taken my eye make off, makeup off for about 10 days and was just had the panda eyes and used to go up and rub my eyes in the morning and took my vision for granted. So every time I see something like these presentations and as I've become older, I am absolutely blown away. So thank you so much, Z. Our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Van, Van Gaskin. Jennifer is a clinician scientist dedicated to preventing blindness from glaucoma. She's a principal investigator at CIRA and she leads the ocular fibrosis research and a glaucoma specialist at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. In 2021, she was named a superstar of STEM by Science and Technology Australia. She's a passionate advocate through her role on Glaucoma Australia's clinical advisory panel. She's also very active in the wider ophthalmic community where she holds multiple leaderships. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be presenting to you today on uh, some of the research I'm doing, especially in World Glaucoma Week, which is, in my opinion, the most important week of the year. Um, I also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're presenting, we're speaking. So, yeah, so my research, as Brom mentioned, is on uh, ways of preventing scarring to prevent glaucoma blindness. And as I start, I'd like to introduce you to, if I can get my slides to work, Irene and George, who are patients of mine, and this is um, presented with their permission. So Irene has glaucoma and has been a patient of mine for a few years. And when she first was referred to me by her uh, general ophthalmologist, these were her visual field tests that were sent to me along with her referral letter. And you might have, um, so Z um, had already established, talked about what visual fields do. And you can see that over a course of not that many years, Irene was rapidly losing her vision very fast in both eyes. And if nothing else is done, then she was heading to blindness um, at a rapid rate. So this would have been a time when we could have used some of these instruments to pick up her rate of progression faster, but unfortunately we didn't have that. So what could I do? Now, when Irene came to me, she was already on all the eye drops that she could take um, and has had laser therapy, and you can see that it hasn't done enough. 
So I performed glaucoma filtration surgery or, gla or trabeculectomy as it's is, is, is more commonly known on her. And I'll just briefly talk about what glaucoma filtration surgery or what trabeculectomy is. It's the most common glaucoma operation done worldwide. It's also still considered the gold standard operation where we surgically create a drainage canal to allow fluid to flow from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye and thereby reducing eye pressure. As Z and Louise have both mentioned, right up until now, the only way we have of treating glaucoma is to reduce the eye pressure in the eye. And so this was something that I did to, for Irene. You can see that it halted her vision for the next six years and it's still her vision still remains stable now and she didn't go on to lose any more sight. And as was already mentioned, currently about 300,000 Australians suffer from glaucoma. So that's three MCGs full of people with this potentially blinding disease. And it is predicted that the numbers are going to double by 2040. So you might say to me, if the operation is considered the gold standard and it is seen as, in Irene's case, very successful at preventing vision loss, why don't we pre perform this operation on everybody with glaucoma? And the trouble with the operation is that despite its success, it has a failure rate of 50% at five years. And the main reason for that is because the drain that we create scars up. Our body's natural healing response is to heal any wound that, we, that is created or that we come across. And that's the reason for the operation to fail. And currently, in all glaucoma operations, we use strong anti-scarring medication to prevent the wound, from, the, the wound from closing up, the drain from closing up. And the most common one of these at the moment you um, used here, right here in this hospital and, and most places in the world is mitomycin C. Mitomycin C is a very strong anti-scarring medication. It's actually a cancer medication used in much larger quantities in bladder cancer. And it's good at preventing scarring, but it's a bit like a sledgehammer. It just kills all the cells. So because of that, it can damage the nearby healthy surrounding tissues and also lead to long-term risk such as tissue thinning, wound breakdown. It leads onto the wound then to leak, which can lead to infection and ultimately blindness or even loss of the eye. So it's, by, it's far from being ideal, but it's the best we have at the moment. So one drug or one compound that my group is testing is a compound called 3,4-dihydroxyflavanol. And this is an antioxidant. So it's a naturally occurring, it, it can be, antioxidants can be found to be naturally occurring in a lot of our fruit and vegetables and red wine and green tea. And it's often protective because of it, it gets rid of free radicals, which are very damaging to our cells. So this particular compound has not been studied in the eye, but it's been studied in other parts of the body and other diseases, and it's been found to be protective in cardiovascular diseases and certain cancers. And then a related compound called casetin is a flavonol, a flavonol that inhibit that has been found to stop scarring in co human corneal cells, so in another part of the eye. And this particular um, flavanol has been studied by Dr. Elsa Chan, who's a senior researcher in my group, and she's worked on this and other diseases in her doctorate. So Elsa thought, why don't we try this in glaucoma surgery and see if it has a similar effect? So what did we do? So we started off in the lab, in, in, in a Petri dish, looking at this compound before we took it to any animal or human models. So we recruited patients here at the INEA, at the glaucoma unit, patients who are undergoing glaucoma surgery, sorry, I'll just, um, and asked them if they'd be willing to donate a little, tiny little bit of their um, eye tissue so that we can test it in the lab. So this is tissue that they, is, they didn't need, excess tissue, and we took about a millimeter of it. We took it and tested it in a Petri dish, um, stimulating it with TGF beta, which is the, the chemical compound in our bodies that naturally stimulates scarring and wound healing. And then we tested it with dihydroxyflavanil to see if it reduced the production of free radicals, whether it reduced this production of scarring proteins, and if it produced the, um, the production or the conversion of the scarring cells. 
and what did we find? So we found that dihydroxy certainly reduced the oxidative stress. So we think this is an additional benefit over and above mitomycin C um, for this, this compound because um, the free radicals can be extra damaging. And it also suppresses the conversion of the fibroblasts, which are the normal healthy cells, to the scarring cells and the reduction of the scarring proteins. And most importantly, it maintained the viability of the cells in the eye, of the, health, of the, the conjunctiva, so the, 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 the natural healing cells around the eye compared to mitomycin C. And I mentioned mitomycin was like a sledgehammer that kills off all the cells, whereas dihydroxyflavonol reduced the scarring but maintained the healthiness of the cells. And next step, we, we uh, stepped it up to an animal model. So we performed a very rudimentary form of a trabecolectomy in mice eyes. And we tested um, the compound against mitomycin C, which is the standard of care, and also just the vehicle control. Um, and then after 14, so the mice received daily treatment with the hydroxyflavonol, one-off treatment with the mitomycin C, just like you do in surgery. And then after 14 days, the eyes were harvested and we looked at the scarring effects um, under a microscope. And you can see here that the red represents collagen, which is the scarring protein in the eye. And in the vehicle, so this is the control group, you can see that the red is much denser and very compacted. So there's a lot more scarring occurring in the control group compared to dihydroxyflavonol and mitomycin C. And if you compare dihydroxyflavonol and mitomycin C, you can probably appreciate that there's probably even less of the rest of the red fibers compared to mitomycin. They're more sparse and not as densely compacted. And if you look at it quantitatively, certainly dihydroxy had the least number of, of collagen. Sorry, I think my slides are on the timer. And again, we can see that there's a reduction of the oxidative stress markers here um, in, the, in the graph. And finally, dihydroxy also suppressed the the amount of myofibroblasts, which are the scarring cells in these mice. Now, with any drug development, it's really important to prove that it works in several models. So first we had the, um, the, the in vitro, so the Petri dish model, then we had the mice, and next we looked at dihydroxyflavonol as an eye drop, because most glaucoma patients, as you know, are very used to applying eye drops. So we looked at how these eye drops performed in rabbits, and rabbit eyes are closer to human eyes, so we performed trabecolectomies in rabbits and looked at how it affected the scarring. And again, you can look at, you can see these photographs here are of the rabbit eyes that have, have undergone trabecolectomies and um, those that just had the vehicle control had much greater numbers of red blood vessels. Now blood vessels stimulate inflammation and therefore scarring so we don't want too many blood vessels um, and by contrast dihydroxy had fewer and then if you looked at mitomycin C, the tissue is stark white because the drug killed off all the blood vessels. So you want some blood vessels there because that helps the, the tissue to heal, but not too much. So it's a fine balance. So in these photographs, dihydroxy really represented sort of the, the ideal picture. And again, quantitatively, you can see that in the eye drops, it also reduced the amount of collagen, so the scarring protein and the number of fibroblasts of the scarring cells in these rabbit eyes. Um, so as Z had mentioned, uh, drug development is it can be very difficult. So the trans we didn't want to fall into this translational uh, valley of death. So not only are we looking at developing new treatments or new medications for stopping scarring and glaucoma surgery. We also want to take other approaches to see if we can prevent scarring in other ways. So this is looking at um, the scarring genes that patients might have and maybe find a way of targeting the genes themselves rather than relying on a drug or a medication. So this is work that um, we're doing with Associate Prof Professor Raymond Wong who he heads the cellular reprogramming and stem cell technology here at CERA. And we're performing RNA sequencing, so looking at the the sequencing of the genes to identify the genetic changes during the process of the fibroblasts, so the normal cells, to the scarring cells. 
So again, we have taken the similar cells that were biopsied from human eyes with glaucoma. We stimulate it with the stimulating scarring factor and then looking at the genetic changes that occur during that pathway. So is there a distinctive conjunctival scarring gene signature in this process? And that work is still un ongoing and we're, we're very close to finishing and, and publishing it and it's showing some really interesting results. And our hope is that the next step we will be able to target those scarring genes to stop them from working during this process. Now this is similar to what I just mentioned but we're looking, we're also working on editing the genes to treat ocular fibrosis or scarring in glaucoma surgery and this is using CRISPR RNA editing technology and this is work done with Associate Professor Rick Liu who's also here at CERA and he, he heads our genetic engineering research department and so we're editing the TGF beta receptor so TGF beta is the stimulating scarring chemical compound in our body to stop its activity and then to block that pathway from the conversion of the healthy fibroblasts to the myofibroblasts and because this is a gene therapy where we're targeting the gene, it will provide a longer term effect rather than needing daily eye drops or even monthly injections like we see in patients with macular degeneration. So this gives a little glimpse of um, some of the work that we're doing to target scarring in the eye, and particularly in glaucoma surgery. So scarring remains the biggest challenge in glaucoma surgery um, even to this day and in many other eye diseases and despite extensive research into various fibrotic inflammatory pathways we haven't really gone much further than mitomycin C which has been around for decades. So we're hoping that increasing the understanding of the molecular and genetic pathways may lead to novel and more specific approaches in therapy for our glaucoma patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Our final speaker today is Dr. Flora Hugh, an optometrist clinician, scientist and research fellow at CIRA and the University of Melbourne. She has a particular interest in new treatments and diagnostics for eye disease that include glaucoma. Flora's research focus is on glaucoma and using eye imaging as a biomarker for brain health. Building upon this, she was involved in a landmark clinical study investigating the use of the hyperspectral imaging to accurately differentiate people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Flora conducted the world first clinical trial of nicotinamide, which is vitamin B3 in glaucoma, showing its potential to be protective in the disease. She's now continuing, thing, continuing thing with this work long-term randomized controlled trial to determine whether nicotinamide can prevent vision loss and be incorporated into standard clinical care. Flora is also a passionate scientist communicator and was selected as the 2022 ABC Top 5 for Science and is one of the superstars of STEM 2023-24. Please welcome Dr. Flora Hu. Thank you, Bron, and can't tell it's your first time hosting. You're doing a great job. And lucky last, um, so stay with me. I um, hope you guys have been enjoying it so far. It's been a great morning and great to hear from the other three. Um, and hopefully you enjoy this one too. So today I'll be focusing on neuroprotection, uh, what it is and some of the work that's been done and some of the work that we're doing here at CIRA. And I first like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're on today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. The great thing about going last is that everybody's already explained everything, so I don't have to explain everything again, um, but just to really drum it in, how do we currently treat glaucoma? <laughs> and really, that's by lowering eye pressure. You've heard it three times, now you've heard it four times. What we do is we lower eye pressure, and we do it by th you know three essential means. We do it by eye drops, we do it by laser therapy, and we do it surgically. And so... And that's because once upon a time, we used to believe that eye pressure caused glaucoma. And so then all our treatments were developed for that purpose. We now know, of course, that that's not the case. Um, we can get glaucoma um, even with normal, seemingly normal eye pressures. Um, but it is still our most well-studied risk factor for developing glaucoma. And so 
This is a visual field printout that Jennifer has also also showed you, but that's fine because it helps me explain it to you too. <laughs> so um, what we do obviously is we do a lot of um, tests such as the visual field test, which is a test of our side vision and it really gives us an idea of um, what you're seeing, um, how well you're seeing and whether things have changed. And obviously when things progress, um, you can see these changes over time. So this is compared to 2016 to 2024. So over eight years, this person has progressed. Um, and we can see that vision loss um, down the bottom in their most recent, recent visual field. And when we look at the back of the eye, we see the changes in the actual nerve itself. So these are three photos of an optic nerve. And over time, um, we can see that um, we can see those physical changes that are happening. But it does mean that our glaucoma our ways of treating glaucoma right now is quite reactive. Um, we wait for loss to appear and we wait for you to lose vision before we change. Um, we, can, we know that things have gotten worse um, and that means that we know we need to change your treatment. And so, as Z has mentioned, around a third of people actually progress and so they lose vision despite treatment. And so we know that pressure lowering is not the only thing um, that's contributing to the condition. So what else can we do um, about it? And Luis has already um, ruined the surprise for me, but that's okay. We already know what we're going to do about it. Um, but I'm going to talk about it again but in a little bit more detail. So here comes the concept of neuroprotection. So what actually does neuroprotection mean? So it basically means you know, mechanisms and strategies, so ways that we're gonna to use to defend the central nervous system um, against injury and protect it from neurodegenerative diseases. So that's the general term um, of neuroprotection. In, and when we talk about it in the eye and in glaucoma, we're looking at protecting the nerve cells that are affected in glaucoma, um, the ones that are damaged, the ones that are likely to be damaged. And this stra these strategies are talking about what else can we do aside from pressure lowering. And that really builds into um, a lot of the risk factors that we know we have in glaucoma. The two really big ones are aging and high eye pressure. Um, I don't have a cure for aging. Um, so, and believe me, a lot of people are trying to work on it. Um, but aging of course is our highest, is our biggest risk factor for developing glaucoma. As we get older, the incidence of glaucoma does increase. Um, and, but there are a lot of other factors at play as well. There's genetics, um, there's people who are heavily short sighted um, and some of the things that I'm going to talk about today is some of the vascular risk factors so impaired blood flow as Louise has mentioned um, and metabolism because of course um, as Louise has also said that our nerve cells use a lot of energy all the time in order for us to see properly and to process the light that enters the eye so that we can actually send messages to our brain so that we can see and all this happens instantaneously all the time and we don't even know it's happening but it consumes a lot of energy and outside of the brain um, the retina actually consumes um, the most energy by weight. And so as you heard from at the start um, our nerve cells don't store energy um, so they have to get it from they get it from the blood vessels to get their nutrients and oxygen and they get it from mitochondria. So there are a lot of mitochondria in the eye um, because they actively produce energy all the time in order to feed the nerve cells so that, so that they can keep functioning. And so there's been studies to show that mitochondria, and there's been quite a few studies now to show that mitochondria are actually injured early on in glaucoma. And so there's a question about whether they actually are unable to now meet the energy demands that the nerve cells need. Because they can't meet the energy demands, these nerve cells get injured over time and then we can lose them over time. And that's how we lose vision. So really the question is like, how can we support mitochondrial health then so that they can um, function better and produce the energy, meet the energy demands of the retina? So some of the options around, um, some of them you may have already heard of. So there are ways to reduce oxidative stress. So that's, those, this is the use of antioxidants. So, um, and these include things like citicoline and coenzyme Q10. Um, there's compounds around increasing blood flow to the retina and that's ginkgo. And so people who may have glaucoma here may have actually already heard of these three compounds. 
And the idea about it is to um, help with these risk factors that we have with glaucoma, supporting um, the nerve cells to give them more energy, but also try to improve the blood flow to their retina as well. And so there have been some, there definitely have been positive results in lab-based studies. And honestly, if we look at lab-based studies, we've cured glaucoma many times over. Um, but the hard bit, of course, is doing it in um, people and showing that in clinical studies. As Z has mentioned, it is quite hard. Um, and there have been a few, uh, quite a few uh, clinical studies now that have involved these three compounds. And um, there have been smaller populations, um, but they do show some positive results. And so even, for example, last year there was one on um, taking acetylcholine orally um, and people who had glaucoma, they showed an improved um, quality of life um, compared to um, people on placebo. Um, and they, there have been some conflicting results, though, and it's partly because these studies have been small. And neuroprotection studies are actually quite hard to do. And the reason is partly because we're quite good clinically at detecting loss. We're very good at detecting that you've lost vision, you've lost nerve cells, but we're not so good at protect, detecting um, protection. Um, or, and that's what Z is working on, of course, um, but that's what makes it so hard. And it does make it expensive to run as well. And so it doesn't mean these studies are not happening because there actually are a whole bunch of studies that are happening right now that work in neuroprotection. And so one of some of them are here, but for example, um, we're trying to look at, you know, uh, supporting nerve cell health um, through um, gene therapy or through um, surgery. Can we actually put implants in that actually secrete a growth factor that supports nerve cell health? That's an active clinical trial that's happening right now. And there are a whole bunch of other clinical trials happening all around the world to try and protect nerve cells in people who have glaucoma. A question I get a lot is around exercise. Um, you know, can exercise help us in glaucoma? And that's the theory and the mechanism behind how exercise works is also about um, enhancing and supporting mitochondria in order to reduce oxidative stress on the retina. And it means that the cells can become um, stronger and more resilient um, and, pre and pre um, prevent injury. Studies in exercise are a little bit conflicting, it, we tend to now believe that it's a U-shaped curve, that extreme exercise is not good, but also not doing exercise is not good. And both of those, um, either ends of those extremes seem to be at, give you a higher risk um, of developing glaucoma. So exercise is important, but don't go at it too hard. Um, but, and we also know things like, for example, people with um, pigmentary glaucoma that, you know, there are certain yoga exercises, for example, that may not necessarily be good for their glaucoma because they can raise their eye their eye pressure. So everything in moderation, but don't forget exercise is good for you. But what we've been looking at here is um, another key factor that is important in supporting mitochondria. And this is NAD. So NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And it's actually a real, it's a built, it's one of the fundamental building blocks for life. Um, life on earth doesn't exist without NAD. And so NAD actually plays a key role in energy production in mitochondria. And, and so we actually know that as we get older, we naturally have lower levels of NAD in our body. And we've also know that the um, enzymes that are involved in recycling NAD in the body are actually essential to, um, for the health of nerve cells. And the key pathway that we use in the eye to make NAD is a recycling pathway, which is, if I find my mouse, is this recycling pathway here, where nicotinamide in the green is actually used to recycle NAD. And as recently as last year, we've shown that this pathway is the dominant pathway for us to create NAD inside the eye. We now also know that there are actually people with glaucoma tend to have lower levels of nicotinamide in their blood serum. So all of this kind of culminated into a question though, so can we actually boost NAD levels in the eye in people with glaucoma, well in mice in glaucoma first, by giving them nicotinamide? 
And so this was done in a seminal study in um, mice. So this was done in a mouse model of who are genetically predisposed to develop glaucoma. And they fed them nicotinamide. And nicotinamide is a type of vitamin B3. So they fed it in their diet, diet and um, waited to see what happened. And of course, there was a group that were untreated and there was a group that were treated. And if we look at counting cells, which is looking at counting the amount of red cells, those are the nerve cells that we have in the retina. Those are the ones that we lose in glaucoma. So compared to, compared to not treating it, treating it with nicotinamide meant that we preserved a lot of the cells in the retina. So more cells survive compared to um, just being on placebo treatment. And importantly, they measured how these cells were working as well and found that the retina was actually working a lot better um, compared to when um, they were taking placebo. So not only were these cells surviving, but they were functioning as well. So here at Serial, what we, decide, we did was our first translational study, taking that, taking that science out of the lab and putting it into the clinic. And the great thing about nicotinamide is that it is a widely available drug already. Um, people take it as a vitamin supplement a lot of the time for um, a skin cancer purpose. And the reason why is because there was a big clinical trial around using it to prevent um, skin cancer in Australia. And so we did this first trial here um, at CIRA in people with glaucoma. And we really just wanted to know, can we detect a change in people who have glaucoma? So we did this study in about, um, in a few years ago now, and this was in people who had mild to moderate glaucoma. And we did it in, these, in this group of people because we believed that they um, were more likely um, to benefit. Um, they had more likely to, um, they didn't have severe vision loss, um, but they meant that there was probably a big population of nerve cells in their eye that were probably in that injured stage and could actually benefit from having nicotinamide on board. And so they actually, um, it was what we call a crossover study where the groups actually took both the B vitamin B3 as well as the placebo. And what we found, if we start from the left, is that when they were on placebo, nothing really happened to how their nerve cells were functioning. And then in the blue, that after taking the vitamin B3 for three months, that we did show a significant change, a significant boost in how their nerve cells were working. And when we looked at their visual field changes, um, we found that in general, um, the group uh, performed a bit better on their visual fields um, after they were taking the vitamin B3 as opposed to when they were taking the placebo. So this is the first kind of uh, promising result that we had from this study, and it's since been um, also shown in another study done in the US um, where they found something similar, where they used nicotinamide and pyruvate. Um, pyruvate, again, is another um, essential compound in producing energy in the eye um, and also found something similar to us. So really, this raises a couple of questions. What happens over the long term? As we know, glaucoma is a chronic condition. Um, it's not just going to go for three months. It goes for years. We need to understand, you know, can we actually slow down glaucoma in the long run? And what about the different populations as well? And there are many different types of glaucoma. And so does vitamin B3 actually um, support the health of nerve cells in different types of glaucoma as well? And this has really led us to this big international collaboration that we're doing um, right now that, and that I'm part of across um, here in Melbourne, in Sydney, in Adelaide, in Singapore, in Sweden, and in the United Kingdom. And so this is um, a very big study across, um, across all these different countries. And the idea is to be able to work out, you know, should we be prescribing nicotinamide to people who have glaucoma? And so this is a two-year study um, uh, where people are either taking vitamin B3 or taking placebo. And currently, um, because we, um, we are looking at um, how our visual field changes over two years' time, and hopefully in the future with uh, Z finding new ways to detect change earlier, we don't have to run such a, a long study. Um, but 
Really what we want to know is can we actually slow down vision loss with nicotinamide? And this is on top of our current therapies. So uh, we already have pressure, eye pressure lowering using drops or surgery or laser. And so can we add to it so that we can actually prevent um, vision loss, especially in those people who continue to progress despite our current um, efforts? And so I'm going to finish off in here just to talk about a little briefly about vitamin B3. Um, and the reason why is because there are actually many different types of vitamin B3. Um, and we're specifically studying nicotinamide. And so um, the, uh, when, you think of vitamin B, when you think of vitamin B3, the most common one that people think of is niacin, and that's what we find in Vegemite. Um, and niacin is distinctly different to nicotinamide. Um, so don't go out there and eat lots of Vegemite because I cannot guarantee that it's going to do anything for your glaucoma. Um, and there are other forms of vitamin B3 too that are currently being studied. Um, one of them, nicotinamide riboside, is also being looked at in glaucoma. Um, in a trial done in Hong Kong at present. So I'm going to end on here, which is how should I look after my eyes? And a real key thing, and it is World Glaucoma Week, so I am going to remind everybody to get your eyes tested, especially if you haven't, um, even when you feel your vision is fine. And that's really because glaucoma is very sneaky, and a lot of the time we don't know that we've got it until we go get our eyes tested. Um, and the, really the most important thing is that if you do have glaucoma, is remember to tell your family members as well. Um, I alluded that there was a genetics component to it, and there is. So if you do have glaucoma, tell your family members. Um, it's quite common to actually, um, for, for me to see patients, for example, who I subsequently say they have glaucoma and then they find out that another, their sister has glaucoma and they just had no idea. Um, and it does increase your lifetime risk of developing glaucoma significantly. So do remember to tell your family if you do currently suffer from it. And so thank you very much. And from here, I'd like to pass it back to Bronwyn. I think I should check in with everybody. How, how is the audience doing now? We've had four presenters, a lot of clinical terms and research terms. Hope you're enjoying it. Um, I'm not sure why I get a whole slide to myself. I just, I'm wondering if my mother contacted somebody in the department, but you know who I am already. So it's time for the Q&A, so we'll move on to there. So I'm going to invite, just a quick bit of housekeeping for this, I'm going to invite our four speakers up to come to the front. We've had a number of questions from our participants online. So I think what we'll do is we'll alternate from a question in the audience to a question from somebody online. Um, I'll invite our presenters up and while I'm there coming up, I'll introduce you to Matt on your right and Gabby on your left who I work with and they'll be able to take your questions. So is there anyone who'd like in the audience here at the Martin Family Auditorium, would somebody in the audience like to ask the first question? Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all. Uh, the, your presentations are fantastic, and that's true of every CIRA forum I've uh, uh, been privileged to attend. So thank you very much. Um, I, I guess my question is really, um, we, we, I'm old, all right, um, <laughs> we get lots of stuff about healthy ageing, so I walk and I try and not drink too much, and we eat lots of veggies and all that sort of stuff, so we're doing the healthy ageing thing. Uh, are there, is there any real evidence that the healthy ageing recipes really improve eye health? Um, and are there any studies where you sort of not only give nicotinamide or something else, but you also put people on a treadmill? So in other words, you do multi-factor type studies. Thanks. You'd like to take that. Um, I can take this. So look, um, Flora sort of touched it up on the, in her talk, we don't have any specific evidence that shows that healthy ageing definitely improves um, glaucoma specifically, or as far as I'm aware, general eye health. But is healthy, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, I think is important for your general medical health, which can 
by implication lead to better eye health in many ways and for my glaucoma patients I think the first thing that comes to mind is remembering to take your eye drops you know if you're more alert better cognitive cognitive function you're going to remember to put in your eye drops better because we there are lots of studies that have shown that unfortunately glaucoma patients are not great at at, at, at putting in their eye drops and it's hard you know I've had to take eye drops myself for certain things and I can't remember if I've already done it that day if I've you know if I did it did I do it this morning or was it last night and their studies have shown that even if patients know that they're being monitored to whether they're taking drops or not a lot of them don't even go to the pharmacy to fill their scripts so that's how bad we are generally at taking our drops but also medications in general so I think if you're healthier you're more alert you're more motivated you're going to be better at, at, at following um, your medical regimen and 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 taking your therapies yeah I think I can add something to that I mean of course we don't we don't have those studies yet but definitely we have studies for example that we know that good exercise moderate exercise is better for the, the things that we were talking, I was talking in the presentation for better uh, blood pressure, better, and we know that that is important for how the retina, the, the eye, is working. So definitely we don't have the studies, but we know that things that can affect very much the eye is better if you do some exercise, if you have healthy life. So yeah, I mean, I would say <laughs> go for the, for the exercise if, if you have a choice, of course. Terrific, thank you. I'm actually now going to ask a question from one of our online participants, and I do apologise if I've um, shortened them somewhat because we've got limited time. So thank you to Colin for sending this question in. To what extent are tinnitus and glaucoma linked, and does one affect the other? A Google search returns some link between the two, and when I asked the Facebook glaucoma support group if anyone had tinnitus, a considerable number of people replied in the affirmative. Recently, my tinnitus increased quite a bit, and at the same time, my pressure increased. What's, what's it all mean? So I'm happy to add a bit to that. So um, thank you. And yes, you are right. There has been um, some studies to show that there is increased risk of developing tinnitus when you have glaucoma. Um, a study came out um, at couple of years ago, and, uh, and one, one in 2020, one in 2022. Um, looking at surveying people who have um, primary open angle glaucoma, which is the most common type of glaucoma we have in Australia, um, and found that people who did suffer from um, open angle glaucoma did have an increased incidence of having tinnitus as well. We don't quite fully understand um, the reasoning of why we have tinnitus and glaucoma at the same time. Um, there is some a hypothesis at the moment looking at that maybe it's due to poor blood flow. Um, and as, as we might have uh, realised from today, blood flow, having proper blood flow to the eye is really important um, in glaucoma. And, and, and so that's the current belief around what might be actually happening, but more research needs to be done to really understand um, why why the two seem to be happening together. Terrific, thanks Laura. We've got another question from the audience. Okay. Uh, yes, to anyone who wants to answer down there, thank you very much for your presentations. What is the ideal blood pressure for the eye? Um, I've had glaucoma for quite a few decades, so it was in the family and uh, my blood pressure, my eye pressure is coming down. So I'd been in the teens and then it got down to about the tens and now it's in the five and I'm sort of thinking is it getting too low? Are you talking about eye pressure? Eye What's pressure. the ideal eye pressure? Yeah, yeah so nor I think most of you would know normal eye pressure is 10 to 21 but for glaucoma patients that's just being in the normal range is often not enough and unfortunately this is very individual so you'll have to talk to your ophthalmologist about this because as you say there are patients there are people who have pressures in the single digits um, and that's what you need to be to stop your glaucoma from progressing and for some people five may be too low because the eye is a bit I always tell my patients the eye is a bit like a tire or a ball you don't want the pressure to be too high it doesn't work well if the pressure is too high but it doesn't work well if the pressure is too low either the eye can sort of deflate a bit like a ball if the pressure is too low but there are patients who you know after, particularly after I've done glaucoma surgery on their pressures can get down to about five but the eye 
stable, that it doesn't deflate and their eye can tolerate it. So, you know, that pressure is perfectly fine for those patients. So it is, so it is a very individual thing. And I just wanted to add that, and that's why it's important to look at what other therapies we can do aside from lowering the eye pressure, because there is a flaw effect. We can't go too low, as Jen was just saying, but some people continue to progress despite having low pressures. So, and, um, so that's why we need to look at you know, how can we actually change and modify the other risk factors in glaucoma so that we can provide additional support to the nerve cells at the back of the eye um, in addition to um, pressure lowering. Thank you. Um, our next question I'll take from online is from Marie, who has pigmentary glaucoma. She says, are there any updates on research in this area? Might be a very short answer, I'm afraid, Marie. OK, I'm going to take the short answer. And the short answer is um, there isn't specifically for pigmentary glaucoma. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is really the answer, that no current... Um, yeah, insights and particularly on that on that type of glaucoma it doesn't mean that it's not being studied um, and for example in our study here in vitamin b3 we are interested in people with pigmentary glaucoma as well um, to look at whether um, the vitamin b3 is going to be effective in people who have this type of glaucoma look could you just explain what the difference is with pigmentary glaucoma yeah, so um, we have what we call um, primary and secondary glaucomas. Um, and so pigmentary glaucoma is basically where we have a buildup of pigment inside the eye where the fluid is supposed to drain out of the eye. So the eye is an enclosed system, like as Jen just said, but in order to get nutrients into the eye, we produce a fluid and because it's enclosed, we have to drain it out. Otherwise, the pressure builds up inside the eye. And so the location where we drain the fluid out, um, it looks a bit like a drain, of course, and it can get blocked up. And if it gets blocked up by pigment, then it's basically clogging up the drain. Fluid doesn't uh, exit the eye properly and then pump it up with nerve damage as a subsequent of that. We call that a secondary type of glaucoma because it's due to a secondary cause um, to give us um, damage to the nerve cells. Um, but that's what pigmentary glaucoma is about. All right. Thanks, Flora. That's great. I've got another two questions here. Jen, Jen uh, There is, thank you, uh, fantastic presentations. A uh, question about genetic factors and glaucoma. Um, on my wife's side, there's a recognized um, glaucoma in coming down the line. Um, is there anything that's done for early intervention? Or is it just reactionary research? I know you guys are doing some brilliant work, but is there anything to prevent younger people uh, in the same generational thing which will stop glaucoma happening or reducing its effect, please. Thank you. That is a great question and a complex question. And as you know, with glaucoma, genetics is a key part as, as a risk factor. But there's been more than 100 different genes that have been identified in association with glaucoma, some of them being rare and highly penetrant or having a really strong effect. Then you get lots of other little ones that add up and accumulate and contribute to that risk of glaucoma. And having... Um, having that knowledge or um, that's why a family history on knowing that you have a family history of glaucoma is really important as you highlight. Um, but currently the mainstay sort of management that we have for people with a family history of glaucoma it is that regular monitoring that um, Flora noted to getting your eyes checked regularly over time so that if we begin to see early telltale signs that glaucoma is developing, then an intervention might be um, a sensible thing to initiate. Because you also don't want to start someone who's perhaps 18 or 20, you know, many, many years before something is warranted. Because treatments, to subject someone to lifelong treatments for such a long time isn't always such a good thing. So um, one of my Brazilian colleagues once said, glaucoma is kind of like this test of time. It's very tricky. You have to find the right time to intervene. But a key part of that is to make sure that we monitor carefully and to watch it closely. Hope that helps. Do you guys want to add to that? I just want to add that there's a key piece of technology um, called polygenic risk scores. 
Um, and polygenic risk scores is by taking a um, genetic sample and analysing it and trying to determine your risk of developing glaucoma in the upcoming years. So that's a big technology that's been developed around the world, but specifically in Adelaide. Um, and that's going to become a reality in, in, in clinical practice that people may actually have that genetic test done so that we can get an idea of, of their risk. So even though we don't have treatments to prevent glaucoma, it gives you an idea of how closely you should be monitoring it um, as you get older. Thank you. We've just got time for two more, so I'll throw the next one to our online audience. This one's from Dorothy and Jen. I might ask you this. It's got three short questions. So is glaucoma a definite side effect for people with hyperthyroid disease? How successful is a cataract operation with a titanium stent in treating glaucoma? And is it common for twins to have glaucoma? Uh, and you've got 30 seconds. No, 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 you've got more than that. It's um, just a so complex question. So the first question. question is, so patients with th thyroid eye disease, thyroid eye disease in particular, hyperthyroid, so where the thyroid hormone over um, is overacting, is more likely to get, get glaucoma. And that's a secondary type of glaucoma, like Flora said. And basically you get glaucoma from hyperthyroid because the whole, you, often, you, you might know some people with hyperthyroid and there's a lot of congestion around the eyeball or in the eye socket. So basically the, it stops the drain from, from from working properly, the, the, there's congestion around the eyeball stopping the fluid from draining out. It's not 100% that you will get glaucoma, um, but it's more likely because of that congestion. And often because people with thyroid eye disease, it's, it's an obvious condition. People get onto treating thyroid, uh, hyperthyroid quickly and um, they more likely get ocular hypertension, so high pressure in the eye, that doesn't necessarily lead to damage of the optic nerve. So that's kind of the distinction really. So you can have high pressure in the eye that not necessarily causes damage if you get onto it early enough. So, and it's not 100% um, that you will get that, but it is more common. Now the second question is about the stent. The titanium yeah, stent. so there are more and more, Flora showed some of the photographs on her slide. There are more and more of these stents coming out um, on the market, so they're what we call minimally invasive glaucoma operations or devices that help to reduce, again, intraocular pressure. So it helps bypass the maybe blocked drainage canal or open up the drainage canal to allow more fluid to drain out. They work very well. There are plenty of studies, uh, randomised control trials, one out of the Iron Air, which um, we've done from the glaucoma unit, looking at the eye stent, which is one of those devices, showing that, yes, definitely it reduces eye pressure over approximately two years. The effect is not as great, for example, as trabeculectomy. So they're good at uh, for patients with mild to moderate glaucoma because it tends to reduce your pressure down to about the mid-teens. So those patients who need a really low pressure, you're not generally not going to get it with these um, minimally invasive um, bypass devices. And the effect is not forever. So most studies have shown the effect is approximately two years and has the effect of re reducing one of your medications um, in general, typically. Yeah, and what was the third question? Oh, look, look, first of all, I'd like to just thank Flora, who has to leave. We'll just finish up with our last question. Can you thank Flora while she goes? Thank you. Sorry, we might skip the, the third question, yeah, if that's all right, Jen. And we've got one more question left in the audience for this gentleman here. I'm, I'm having stents put in, and one of the things that came up was... Sorry. Oh, one of the things that came up was about the... Um, medication, that cancer medication, it sort of blocks up as well, so... Yeah. So unfortunately we can't use the med cancer medications in the eye because it is so toxic. So we keep this on the surface, out of the eye, in the healing wounds. But yes, stents can block up and unfortunately we don't have a solution for that right now. But that's something that, you know, one of the non-toxic medications that hopefully my team is working on may be able to, we be able to use in stent surgery down the track. So in the meantime, do I take it or do I... Do you take which? Um, the stents. I'm getting stents, yes. Yes. But if they give me a medication that's the same as that... So no, so there isn't, I, I've, I very much doubt your doctor will be offering a medication right. to block the stents because there isn't such a thing. So our one isn't available in humans yet because we haven't got that far. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you.
All right, thank you. I'm sorry that has to be our last question. We could be here for uh, uh, a long time yet. Um, I just want to say that these community forums are really so important for us at CIRA to be able to commit, um, connect with you out there in our community. And it's our way of saying thank you for your ongoing support and interest. Um, your feedback is so important to us, especially as we take our community forums forward. In the next couple of hours, you'll receive a guest survey that'll come through online. It'll probably take somewhere between 90 seconds and two minutes. There are eight or nine questions. If you could provide your feedback to us and tell us what you like, what you didn't like, what you'd like to hear about, what you'd like to know more about, we will certainly respond and adapt and try and meet you halfway and find out what you're interested in hearing. Um, I'd also like you to join me once again in thanking our other three speakers, Professor Luke Zetel Wu, Dr. Jen Van Gasken, and Dr. Louise. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for coming today. It's greatly appreciated, as well as everyone online. Just before we finish up, I have to tell you about our glaucoma appeal, which is running right now. All the funds raised will go towards helping those that you've witnessed today and their teams in growing and taking further reaches in their glaucoma research. To those of you online and in the room who've already made a donation, thank you so much, quite literally from the bottom of our hearts. It's wonderful to know that you're interested in our work. For those of you who may like to make a donation today or in the future, you can always go online to sira.org.au. If you'd like to find out about any more of the rest of the work that we do here at Sira, whether it's with age like age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, or some of the other eye diseases, you can go on to sira.org again, and you can sign up to receive our monthly e-news, which is called iNews, or our twice-yearly um, newsletter called Visionary. So you can do that. So that brings us to the end today. For those of you who've come, again, a huge thank you. It is lovely to see so many faces. I'd love to thank the speakers, my other colleagues who are here, people from their teams who are here to support them, and you, our audience, and everyone online as well. For those of you who are here, I've overcated, and we'd love you to stay behind and catch up with some of our speakers, or indeed anyone from Sierra that you'd like to chat to, and a light luncheon will be served down towards the back of the auditorium. Thank you so much and goodbye.